I welcome you for all the session of the day one. I call upon uh, Dr. A. Padmareka Ma'am, Associate Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, SRM University, Katangolatu. She is going to deliver her lecture on the topic of temperature sensitivity of bitumen. Welcome you, ma'am, for the session two program. I request you to start the session, ma'am. A, uh, a brief introduction about ma'am. Uh, sir, I will. Uh, yeah. So, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Rebecca, you can carry. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sharing my screen. So is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am, is it visible, ma'am? You can now share the presentation. Yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am. I can use it to see the first slide. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Shoba. Shoba, uh, right? Yeah, ma'am. You can uh, make us a full screen, ma'am, by clicking F5. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, yes. sure. yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So good morning all. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about temperature susceptibility of the bitumen. So before we move into the topic, uh, uh, we just uh, appreciate the effort taken by MNM Jain College and Professor Rajan for uh, organizing such a big uh, training program and calling all the experts all over India and uh, 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 helping to disseminate the knowledge from all the experts uh, to a wide group of uh, highway engineers. Thank you so much, sir, and giving an opportunity for me to present in such a forum. And uh, today, talk will be around the temperature susceptibility of the bitumen. And you have you had uh, nice uh, you had listened to a nice lecture by Professor Murli Krishnan on uh, IS seventy three. Hope my voice is audible to all. Shabha, is my voice yes, audible? Yes, ma'am. Your voice is clear and is audible. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, temperature susceptibility of bitumen. I hope most of you are civil engineer. So, civil engineers, uh, uh, like we use binder for uh, holding uh, aggregates, generally. Binder maybe in terms of uh, cement or many, 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 many binders are available. Uh, so like civil engineers, we have been introduced to many binders, one such as uh, bitumen. Uh, but uh, in what way bitumen differs from other binder is a uh, three uh, basic functions uh, in which bitumen differs from other binder. One is a uh, temperature sensitive characteristics of a binder or bitumen. Uh, say for example, if you take a bitumen, um, uh, you take two temperature, two extreme temperature, maybe at the one is at 20 degrees Celsius, another is at 160 degrees Celsius, or 20 even minus 10, 0 degrees Celsius, very less temperature. So at uh, 0, 20 degrees Celsius, bitumen will be a kind of a solid kind of a substance, which you can see in this picture, a bitumen with a, a solid bitumen at a low temperature. The same bitumen, when you heat it, or as the temperature increases, uh, the uh, bitumen starts flowing, um, you see maybe at 60 degree the flow will be relatively lesser compared to 130 or 135 degrees Celsius, it will be 160 degrees Celsius, almost it flows like a water. So it's a very temperature dependent uh, behavior that differentiates a bitumen from the other binders that UK civil engineer use. So the main characteristics, so when you study a bitumen, the main characteristics which you have to focus is a temperature sensitive characteristic. So you yeah, are not saying that other materials do not depend on the temperature conditions, but the bitumen is very sensitive to a change in the temperature. So another another character that differs a bitumen from other binder is a time sensitive response to a loading. See, for example, you just take uh, uh, just uh, stick a bitumen to between two stones and uh, just pull the stone, apply some constant loading, something which is shown here in this picture. So now when you pull the stone, uh, assume that you apply some uh, constant loading, maybe 50 kilo, 50, 50 kg load, you just pull it and uh, hold the 50 kg constant over a period of time, maybe for uh, one minute. 
So what we expect is that there will be a deformation, initial deformation. So when you stretch it, you can see the material in the condition. Application here will not be constant, it depends on time. Characteristics of the vitamin is another character that differs uh, uh, from other material. And one more very important thing is an aging characteristics of the vitamin. So, a vitamin, when you take the vitamin at the fresh conditions or at the initial, immediately after construction. You see that uh, vitamin, uh, uh, for example, if you take a viscosity, viscosity of a vitamin at the fresh payment will be a different. And as the uh, as the payment ages, maybe after a few years, five years, six years, if you take and uh, you extract a vitamin from the payment and you measure the viscosity, same vitamin will have a uh, high viscosity. It means due to aging, uh, the vitamin, viscosity of a vitamin will increase. So these are the three characteristics uh, very important to a vitamin. One is a temperature sensitive characteristics, other is a time sensitive characteristics, school loading, and the third one is the aging of a vitamin. So, so all civil engineers, we will be familiar with uh, just uh, low characteristics, uh, assuming that uh, time independent behavior. So now here, we are going to look into a temperature sensitive characteristics and time dependent characteristics of the vitamin. Main focus is on the temperature sensitive characteristics of the vitamin. So, if you want to study the temperature sensitive characteristics of the vitamin, you should know what is the temperature of interest for the highway engineers. So, for this, you should know what is the process that vitamin is going through when you when you construct a road. So, uh, during a payment constructions, so what we do is we mix a vitamin with an aggregate. Uh, you can see a picture here. Mixing of bitumen, uh, when you mix a bitumen with an aggregate, so uh, something it will look like this, a bitumen coated uniformly over an aggregate. So uh, this we generally do it in a uh, mixing plant at very high temperature, maybe near 160 degrees Celsius. Uh, if it is a modified binder, it's still higher than 160 degrees Celsius. So this is a mixing of bitumen with an aggregate. So at this uh, mixing process, the temperature will be around 160 degrees Celsius. And so from the uh, mixing plant, once you carry it to a site and a compact, so automatically the temperature of the mixture will reduce. Uh, so from uh, 160 degrees, maybe all the way to 120 or as low as, low as 90, 85 degrees Celsius during compactions. So the temperature is reducing from 160 to 80 degrees Celsius during compactions. So this is what it is happening uh, to a material temperature during a mixing and a compaction process. So as a payment material, if you want to study the behavior of a bitumen in the temperature region of mixing and compaction region, the temperature of interest for a payment engineer is uh, from uh, 160, maybe you can uh, take as high as 200 degrees Celsius for a modified binder. So from 200 degrees Celsius, to all the way to 80 degrees Celsius is the interest uh, the, uh, is the temperature which we are interested in. And uh, next is after construction, when you open this payment to a traffic, it is subjected to a uh, cyclic variation in a temperature. So this cyclic variation in the temperature depends upon the air temperature, this we have already seen here. I have taken one uh, table from uh, Nimita and Krishna, which Murli sir was mentioning in the previous lecture about uh, Nimita's uh, uh, MTEC work. The, this table is uh, from the same work here. Now, if you see, uh, you have a different locations. I just picked 10 locations, but the table goes on like this for different uh, cities within India. Now, you can see a maximum air temperature and a minimum air temperature. So, the maximum air temperature is in the range of 30, 35 degrees Celsius. And the minimum air temperature may be in the range of uh, 18 to 20 degrees Celsius. So now with this maximum air temperature, the payment temperature was predicted using uh, some uh, predictive equations. Now let us consider this uh, payment temperature for 99% uh, reliability. Uh, this is a maximum temperature again. So if you see a maximum temperature, so it is in the order of 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. This is a maximum payment temperature. Yeah. Ma'am, one second. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, ma'am, on the screen, could you please click on the hide button, ma'am, so that the value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 thank so, you, ma'am. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So you have a um, maximum uh, payment temperature, uh, like varies from uh, uh, in the range of 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, and the minimum payment temperature, again, minus, you see all the way, as low as minus 1 degree, uh, nearing minus 2 degrees Celsius, and uh, 217 degrees Celsius. This is again at different locations, and uh, uh, different parts, the different geographical conditions. So you see the maximum and the minimum temperature uh, may be from uh, varying from uh, in this locations like minus 2 to maybe as high as uh, 63 degree or 68 degrees Celsius. So the, when the payment, uh, during payment service condition, the payment temperature, uh, maybe we take it as, as low as uh, minus 10 degrees Celsius and as high as 70 degrees Celsius. So if you want to study the behavior of the bitumen during a payment service conditions, our temperature of interest is in the range of minus 10 to 70 degrees Celsius. So this is the temperature which a payment engineer is interested in and how what will be the behavior of bitumen at this temperature region. So now uh, what is that we expect from a bitumen uh, or a binder during mixing and compaction temperature. So like uh, if you want to mix a binder with an aggregate, we want a uniform coating of a binder over an aggregate. You can see a two pictures here which differentiate a uniform and a non-uniform coating. So naturally we expect a uniform coating of a binder over an aggregate. So we achieve this uniform coating when the, uh, the, when the vitamin is flow, if the flow of vitamin is enough to coat a thin, uh, to make a thin coating over an aggregate. So generally, this temperature for an unmodified binder will be nearing 160 degrees Celsius. So bitumen at, uh, should make a uniform coating. We should make a uniform coating over an aggregate during mixing process. And for during compaction process, uh, it, it should like we should give a least effort for a compaction. So temperature during compaction, as I mentioned before, will be in the range of 90 uh, or as minimum as 80 degrees Celsius. So the comp compaction effort uh, should be minimum to uh, to achieve the required de degree of compaction. So this is what we expect from a binder at the, during uh, during mixing and compaction process. So now uh, we were talking about the payment conditions like uh, aggregate mixing of aggregate with and bitumen. So now. Uh, why do you say that bitumen uh, alone as a flow property is, is the, it is a binder property that controls the flow of an entire bitumenous mixture. So we talk only about the temperature sensitive characteristics of a binder here. So it is, uh, you have to keep in mind that we are not talking about the mixture property, it is a binder property that controls the flow of a bitumenous mixture. So that's why we talk here about only the uh, temperature sensitive characteristics of the binder. So now temperature sensitive characteristics of the binder in a mixing and compaction temperature region, if that is in which property do we measure to study the flow behavior of the binder. We have, you have already been introduced to the viscosity of the binder. So um, uh, Professor Murli Krishnan was mentioning about the capillary viscometer to measure the viscosity of the binder. Here it, there is another, uh, another test which was conducted to measure the viscosity of the binder. We call it as a rotational viscometer. So you can see a rotational viscometer uh, schematic here. So you have a um, outer spindle in um, outer uh, cylinder. This cylinder is filled with a bitumen, and you put a uh, spindle inside. Insert a spindle, a spindle inside the chamber cylinder, and uh, when you keep rotating this spindle at uh, some specific speed. What will happen is the bitumen inside will offer will will resist the flow of spindle. So this resistance is measured in terms of a torque, and torque is further converted to the viscosity of the bitumen. So the process is very simple. You have a cylinder, outer cylinder, filled with a bitumen, and insert a spindle into it and rotate the spindle at a specific speed. So the, when you control the rotation, uh, you you. Uh, you can control the rotation of the spindle so automatically you can measure the shear rate so this material inside will offer a resistance to the rotation that resistance is measured as a torque in the material and the torque is converted to the shear stress in the material 
So we know that the shear stress to shear rate ratio gives you the viscosity value. So we can measure the viscosity of the bitumen uh, using a rotation. So this rotational viscometer, uh, we generally use it to measure the viscosity of the binder at high temperatures. So and you also know that viscosity varies with the temperature and viscosity varies with the shear rate. Let us see some of the examples, uh, viscosity plots which was collected. Now if you see this, let's see this is a viscosity measure. Uh, obtained for a uh, bitumen, VG30 bitumen, uh, using a rotational viscometer, a same setup. So if you see this uh, angular velocity, this is an input what we give. So uh, we rotate the spindle at a constant speed for uh, 10 minutes. And this is just an example how the steady shear test has been carried out. So we rotate the spindle at a constant speed for a fixed duration of a time. So now what will be the viscosity? How the viscosity will be varying with the time? So now here it is an apparent viscosity. Hope all of you know what is apparent viscosity. Viscosity as a function of time. Now if you look into a different temperatures here. So this is for a VG30 bitumen. Now if you see, you have three different temperatures. One is at 105 degrees Celsius. 110 degree Celsius and 115 degree Celsius at two different speeds. So 10 revolutions per minute and 15 revolutions per minute at 105 degree Celsius. Let us first focus on this temperature, 105 degree Celsius, 10 revolutions and 15 revolutions per minute. Now if you see this, this first line square legend and the inverted triangle legend here are for a 105 degree Celsius. Now, if you the top one square legend is for 10 rpm and the bottom one is for a 15 rpm. So if you see that the viscosity value here, viscosity value here for a 10 rpm and the 15 rpm are not constant, you can see a reduction in the viscosity as, as the speed increases. So the viscosity has reduced at when you increase the speed of the spindle. One thing is that, another is, you just look into the variation in the viscosity as a function of time. So you have an initial overshoot in the viscosity and the viscosity gradually decreased. Okay. So initially there is an overshoot and after a few uh, seconds or after a few minutes, the viscosity reached a steady state. So, uh, at this, so you can see that the viscosity here is dependent on the speed of uh, spindle or shear rate that's why we call it as an apparent viscosity here so viscosity is a function of shear rate so we call it as an apparent viscosity so and it is also a function of time if i want to know the viscosity value so at what time again the next question is at what speed and at what time are you, are you asking for the viscosity value so again so this is at 105 degrees celsius now if you just increase the temperature from 105 to 110 degrees celsius you can see the next to two bottom line is for the 110 to 1 to 1, 110 degrees Celsius. You can just see that 105 to 110 degrees Celsius, if you increase the temperature, the viscosity is reducing. So again, at the same, it also depends on the speed of the spindle. So viscosity value here depends on the speed of the spindle. Now the next is, again, if you further increase the temperature to 115 degrees Celsius, you can see that the viscosity is still reduced, but you can uh, notice that the viscosity is almost constant with respect to uh, time. So this is like viscosity is dependent on the speed of a spindle. Viscosity depends on the time at which you measure and viscosity depends on the temperature at which you measure. So viscosity is not a constant factor here. Uh, you have three dependent, three factors, testing factors. One is the speed other is a temperature and another one is a time factor. So the so this is a steady shear test in which we kept the spindle speed to be constant with the time. Now what will happen if you vary the speed of the sp uh, speed of the spindle? Say something like this. I vary the speed of a spindle with respect to time. So initially my spindle speed is 5 revolutions per minute. Over a period of time I slowly increase my spindle speed and uh, maybe here all the way it is up to 25 revolutions per minute. So what will be the response of a bitumen? 
so if you see this uh, uh, this test we call it as a shear rate sleep test now if you see the response of a vitamin to this kind of a shear rate sleep experiment you can see that initially at very uh, low shear rate or a low spindle speed you can see the viscosity value almost constant and uh, on further increase in uh, shear rate the viscosity reduced at very high shear rate you can see again the viscosity to be a constant value so you have a three region in the viscosity plot this is apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate so you have a three region in this viscosity plot initial viscosity this is uh, initially viscosity is constant and so this when you project it you can find it out what is a zero shear viscosity the zero shear viscosity in detail uh, will be derived by professor vanya choudhury and um, on further increasing in the speed of a spindle you can see that viscosity reduces since there is a reduction in viscosity with this increase in the speed of a spindle we call this region as a shear thinning region and further increase in a shear rate you can see a uh, infinite shear viscosity so almost a kind of a newtonian behavior in this so this is again at two different temperature let us not focus on what is blended anise asphalt and arblown anise asphalt at this point of time i just want to highlight this 90 and 95 degrees celsius in this plot so if you uh, we will take an example of a blended uh, vg30 vitamin at 90 degrees celsius and 95 degrees celsius now this star ones legend is for a 90 degrees celsius so you can see that initial uh, newtonian response i mean viscosity is constant shear thinning and then finally again viscosity is again constant so at the 95 degrees celsius when you further increase the temperature you can see that the the extent of shear thinning has reduced this is a shear thinning region the extent of shear thinning reduced so this shear thinning extent depends on the temperature okay so when you further increase the temperature from 95 degrees celsius so what will happen so here you can see at 110 degrees celsius and 115 degrees celsius example so you can see that at uh, 110 degrees celsius still there is a small shear thinning observed at 110 degrees celsius and at a still higher temperature you can see that uh, viscosity is constant over all shear rate so viscosity is independent of shear rate is what we call it as a newtonian response so i apply any kind of any speed my but my viscosity value of the material is going to be the same if that is the condition i call the material as a newtonian response uh, so vitamin exhibits a newtonian response at higher temperature in this case it is 115 degrees celsius so it again it depends on uh, at what condition you test whether it is a unmodified binder or a modified binder uh, whether you are testing it in a unaged conditions or an aged conditions or uh, many other factors are here so vitamin exhibits a newtonian response at very high temperature so what is newtonian response here Uh, viscosity is independent of shear rate so um, so here the capillary viscometer what you uh, what we measure at 60 degrees celsius is a newtonian viscosity so viscosity if it is independent of a shear rate i call it as a newtonian behavior so at low temperature they, we we see a uh, viscosity to be a shear rate dependent and shear rate dependent is like you have a shear thinning behavior if you take an example of a blood it exhibits a shear thickening behavior here bitumen is shear thin so what does it mean you keep on rubbing a bitumen maybe you take a bitumen you just keep on applying a shear so when you apply a shear the material thins it flows flow behavior uh, it, it flows or the viscosity reduces so this is uh, Uh, this is at a uh, temperature when you reduce the temperature from newtonian to uh, still further you you see a shear thinning characteristics of a bitumen so as i pointed out before shear thinning characteristics depends on temperature and it also depends on the binder type aging conditions and many other factors so now uh, this is one such table uh, taken from our publications now if you see Uh, let us focus on this uh, blended uh, uh, vitamin it's a vg30 vitamin there is a, a transition happening 
from a Newtonian to non-Newtonian as the temperature decreases. So if you see here, this is uh, the first column corresponds to unaged binder, the second column corresponds to short term aged binder and the third column corresponds to long term aged binder. So what uh, unaged binder if you see, as the temperature is reduced from say 130 degrees Celsius to 90 degrees Celsius, at high temperature you see a Newtonian response and this is a cut off line at 115 degrees Celsius, below 115 degrees Celsius you see a non-Newtonian response. So there is a transition, uh, a transition of uh, transition in the behavior of bitumen that happens when you decrease the temperature from high to low. So this is for an unaged condition. When you look into the aging conditions, as I mentioned during um, the payment bitumen ages, so aging again depends on the temperature and uh, uh, oxidation uh, oxidation rate of oxidation that is happening on to a bitumen. Uh, so during mixing and compaction process, what we do is we heat the bitumen to a high temperature. This heating process may, uh, uh, this due to this heating process, the bitumen ages. You can imagine a bitumen to be a mixture of a, uh, a solid kind of a material that we call it as an asphalting and a fluid kind of a material that we call it as a malting. So fluid kind of a material, it is a volatile in nature. We know that bitumen is an hydrocarbon, it is a volatile in nature. So when you heat this, the volatile substance evaporates and it becomes more stiffer. That is what we call it, uh, that is what it happens when the bitumen ages. So when, a, when we heat the bitumen uh, during mixing and compaction operations, bitumen ages. So due to this aging, uh, we call this aging as a short term aging. Due to this aging, you can see that there is a transition happening at the higher temperature. So means if you take uh, 120 degrees Celsius here uh, in an unaged conditions, it may be an, uh, a Newtonian response. Here at 120 degrees Celsius, it may be a non-Newtonian response. So as the material ages, this transition behavior varies. Now, if this is for the long term age, what is, what is happening to the bitumen? Uh, after maybe five to six years uh, of use in the field. So again, you can see the transition is happening still at a higher temperature. So this is a transition happening in a bitumen at different aging conditions. So in general, if you take it during mixing and compaction operations, there is a transition in the behavior of bitumen from a Newtonian to non-Newtonian. So as at high temperature, you see a Newtonian response and as the temperature decreases, you can see a non-Newtonian response. Uh, the bitumen makes up with a non-Newtonian response. What is non-Newtonian response? A simple viscosity is dependent on a shear rate. Non-Newtonian response, viscosity depends on the shear rate and time of measure. So now, uh, this viscosity parameter is used in determining a mixing and compaction temperature. So I, I want to mix a binder uh, bitumen with an aggregate. So what temperature do I need to mix? How do you decide? How do, how do you how do you decide on what temperature to be used for mixing and compaction of a bitumen and an aggregate in mixing plant? So this temperature is decided based on the bitumen flow behavior. So you know that the flow behavior depends on the temperature. So I measure a viscosity value at different temperature and decide on what is the temperature we have to use for mixing and compaction temperature. So the determination of uh, mixing and compaction temperature are in detail with a mixed design. A, a small part with a mixed design will be directed by Professor Murli Krishnan later in this uh, in the training program. So. Keep in mind that viscosity is shear rate dependent and viscosity is uh, time dependent in the non-Newtonian region. So at high temperature it exhibits Newtonian response and at, uh, as the temperature reduces during compaction it exhibits non-Newtonian response. Okay, so the bitumen is temperature sensitive characteristic, character, the bitumen exhibits temperature sensitive behavior. So what we have seen that, uh, what will be the behavior of bitumen? during mixing and compaction temperature. Now next is during payment service conditions. What will be the behavior of bitumen during payment service conditions? So what is that we expect from a binder during payment service conditions? So we have seen that the payment temperature at different location 
as uh, will be as high as 70 degrees celsius and uh, sometimes as low as minus 0 or minus 10 degrees celsius this is at different locations and it is a uh, temperature is not something constant it is a cyclic variations so now what will happen at higher temperature near 70 degrees celsius and what will happen at lower temperature maybe near 0 or sub uh, sub zero degree sub zero temperature so at high temperature when you load a payment we will just talk about the payment and we relate it to a bitumen later so at the high temperature when we load a payment what will happen is there will be a permanent deformation or a rutting happening in the bitumen you can see a rutting uh, here which is nothing but a permanent deformation in the material see for instance imagine that you have a payment and you are loading the payment this is a stress as a function of time you are loading the payment and you are applying a constant load for a uh, time from t not to t so what will be the response of a bitumen with this time so you see that uh, for this loading there will be a deformation strain here you can also imagine as a function of deformation so there will be a increase in deformation like there is a instantaneous deformation or instantaneous strain here and from t not time to t you can see that the material is creeping with respect to time so as the time increases the creep or a deformation in the material increases so when you remove the load when the traffic load moves away from that portion when you remove the load there will be a instantaneous recovery not the complete recovery there will be a instantaneous recovery but not completely recovered and gone to zero so there will be a instantaneous recovery followed by a slow recovery or a delayed recovery so this is a time dependent characteristics of the material so uh, bitumen exhibits a uh, creep response uh, something like this so now here the question is whether the deformation during recovery time or during rest period goes to zero or there is a permanent or a residual deformation left so if you have a permanent or a residual deformation and if this builds over a repeated loading this leads to a, a failure called as a rutting which is nothing but a permanent deformation in the material you can see a permanent deformation on the payment this is due to a repeated load action there is a unrecovered deformation left during a rest period and it leads to a rutting failure so this rutting failure in the payment happens at very high temperature and when the when the vehicle is at a slow moving generally we observe this at a slow moving traffic point Well, so when the vehicle moves in at a slow speed the point the load time at which the load is acting will be more so this time will become more so automatically the creep will be too high when the vehicle is moving at a slow speed so the rutting in the pavement happens when the vehicle is moving at a slow speed and especially at a high temperature so this is the critical conditions for a rutting so now um, now what will happen uh, at as the temperature reduces so before even we see how uh, as the temperature reduces what will happen so at high payment temperature if you do not want the payment to rut if you do not want the payment to be like deform something like this what is that we expect is we expect the binder to be relatively stiff yeah. so uh, we want a stiff binder a relatively a stiff binder to avoid this kind of a rutting or a permanent deformation so on further uh, if the temperature of the payment reduces or temperature of the bitumen reduces what will happen is we expect the stiff bitumen at the to avoid a rutting and other further decrease in temperature what will happen is uh, the stiffness of a bitumen will increase and it will imagine a kind of a brittle material so as the temperature goes to zero on very less temperature 20 zero on very less temperature uh, the material becomes very stiff there is also another factor here aging on aging maybe at 4 years 5 years 6 years down the line the pain bitumen will also age and it becomes very high viscous means very stiff material so the two factors here uh, stiffness increases with temperature stiffness increases with aging so as the temperature goes down the stiffness increases and as the payment ages the stiffness increases very stiff material will behave like a Uh, like a kind of a brittle material when you load such a brittle material you can observe a cracking something like this 
effective cracking. So this is a structural damage that is caused to the pavement if the stiffness is too high or uh, when the pavement ages. So again, another another issue is here the traffic loading also. It plays a major role in causing this kind of a fatigue cracking. So like uh, even if you go, uh, uh, this fatigue cracking generally occurs at a temperature of uh, like in the range of 20, 0 degrees Celsius. At uh, snow regions where the temperature goes very less than sub-zero, you can see a purely uh, this kind of a crack due to thermal effect. We call it as a thermal cracking. So the crack occurs in a pavement when the bitumen or when, when the material is very stiff. So what is that we expect at high temperature? We want the binder to be relatively stiffer so that there will not be any cracking in the pavement. And at low temperature, we don't want the uh, bitumen to be too stiff so that the, uh, if it is too stiff, the bitumen or a mixture will crack. So now, uh, we have two extremes. One is at low temperature, another is at a high temperature. Now, what will happen if uh, the temperature varies from high to low? So, that uh, variation in the property of a bitumen, here I have mentioned as a stiffness, just for your imagination. You can think of any property, variation in the property of a bitumen with respect to temperature is what we call it as a temperature susceptible characteristics of the bitumen. Here, in this figure, you can see four different temperatures marked here. 135 degrees Celsius high temperature is where we are doing mixing and compaction temperature. 60 degree for a rutting characteristic, 25 degrees Celsius for a fatigue cracking, minus 15 degrees Celsius. Um, this is for a uh, low temperature cracking. So now if you look into this, this is not just a, uh, arbitrary numbers. Uh, just to indicate that there are uh, four different regions uh, based on our uh, requirement from the binder. So if you see that you have uh, three different by slopes here, A, B, C. Imagine these are the characteristics of three different bitumen, A, B and C. So now if you see a bitumen A here, uh, the variation in the property across the temperature is less compared to bitumen C here, which, which has a drastic variation. So we call bitumen A to be more, uh, 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 means bitumen C to be more temperature sensitive compared to bitumen A. Now, bitumen, this plot of A and B are more or less parallel. Only thing is, now the values here, whether it satisfies our requirement or not, is that what we have to check it. So now, uh, what is the codal provision says for, uh, for uh, uh, temperature sensitive characteristics? So most of the codal practice uses the extreme temperature for uh, different needs. You have seen this pl uh, uh, plot as a table in the before lecture. Uh, this is taken from IS 73. Now you can see that the penetration uh, three measures measured at different temperature penetration at 25 degrees Celsius, absolute viscosity at 60 degrees Celsius, kinematic viscosity at 135 degrees Celsius. So um, this kinematic viscosity 135 degrees Celsius during mixing and compaction operation property and this is during wrapping and this is during fatigue cracking. So uh, most of the portal practice what they use is they use the extreme temperature for quantifying different needs. Now the next question is we use the extreme temperature, for example, 60 degrees Celsius. Will the pavement not rut? Will there not be any deformation when the pavement temperature is 55 degrees Celsius? Just think about this. We will uh, answer this a little later, a few slides down. So now, uh, how do we select the binder uh, for different geographical location based on the temperature sensitive characteristics? So as uh, mentioned before, you have a... Uh, four different uh, requirement, one is mixing and compaction, other is rutting resistance, intermediate uh, crack resistance and other is a low temperature crack, uh, uh, temperature cracking resistance. We have, we need to satisfy a bitumen so that uh, this four uh, properties are met. So now during mixing and compaction temperature, what should be the viscosity of a binder? So what we generally do is, we specify the range of viscosity so that uh, the binder will meet 
the specific range of viscosity in the mixing and compaction temperature region. And in the rutting, as I mentioned before, we need more stiff binder. So we give a minimum value. Okay, my binder should exhibit this minimum stiffness to satisfy the uh, rutting need. It means my before, so I don't want the payment to rut. So I use this minimum stiff binder. So you can see a minimum stiffness. If maximum stiffness can be anything, but I need a minimum stiffness to be this. But maximum stiffness is restricted in case of the fatigue cracking. I don't want a binder to be too stiff at this uh, 20 degrees Celsius, for instance. Uh, if it is too stiff, it will go, it will crack. Again, okay, this stiffness is restricted in, in case of the thermal pure thermal cracking. Petty cracking is something at temperature and a load, load related cracking. Thermal cracking is something which is a purely a temperature related cracking. So now if you see, you have three binders here again, A, B and C. If you take C binder, see you can see that mixing and compaction range is met in the case of a binder C. It, stiffness is above the minimum requirement uh, at, during at the rutting temperature or at 60 degrees Celsius. Stiffness is below the requirement at the 20 degrees Celsius, which, which meets the requirement, maximum range we are specifying. And again, at the thermal cracking, uh, the stiffness is relatively low when compared to us. So the binder C uh, satisfies the, all the conditions here. And if you see, you take a binder B and binder A, binder B, if you just take an example first. So uh, you see that uh, it do not meet a low temperature criteria. It meets a rutting criteria, high temperature criteria during service. It do not meet the low temperature criteria. Now, if you look into binder A, it do not meet the high temperature criteria, but this is okay in case it's for the fatigue cracking related. So now, which binder you will select it? Do we omit binder A or binder B? So, so the uh, answer is no, we need not omit binder A or a binder B. We can select the binder A and binder B based on the temperature of the particular locations. So the uh, binder A can be used in a locations where the temperature is predominantly low and binder B can be used at the locations where the temperature is predominantly high. So we select the binder based on the temperature sensitive characteristics of the uh, binder behavior. So now um, just think about the question which I asked before. Uh, See, the, we say that there is a rutting in the payment at 60 degrees Celsius. Will the payment not rut at 55 degrees Celsius? So the uh, payment is uh, payment temperature. We know that it is a cyclic variation. It is not a sudden uh, only 60 degree. It varies from low to high in a gradual way. So you have to also know that the payment temperature not only varies at the surface. It also varies as you go deep below, surface temperature or the temperature at uh, 10 mm below, 20 mm below will not be same. So the temperature also varies along with the depth. So the payment temperature varies gradually. So most of the coder provision consider the maximum temperature to characterize, uh, to grade the bitumen, consider the means of um, maximum temperature. Now you just consider a maximum temperature as 60 degree. We use this for a cutting characteristic. So the next question here is payment ruts not only at 60 degree, but there will also be a deformation when the payment temperature is 55 degree Celsius or even lesser. Now what should we do? Do we consider only the extreme temperature or it should be a cumulative distress at all the temperatures? So hence, uh, the distance should be a cumulative measure at all the temperature and not at the extreme temperature. So that we will see at the end of the thing how to make a cumulative distance at the uh, at cumulative, uh, how to measure a cumulative distress at different temperatures. So we have seen an overall picture how the uh, vitamin uh, is uh, temperature sensitive. And uh, what is that we expect from a bitumen at different temperature? Uh, now, uh, we will just look into the rheology of the bitumen, flow behavior of the bitumen over a wide range of temperature. See, uh, for example, if you heat the bitumen all the way from minus 50 degrees Celsius to 150 degrees Celsius, at very low temperature, bitumen will uh, be something like a glass type of a material, glassy behavior, 
as the temperature increases, uh, behavior will vary from glass to viscoelastic. So viscoelastic behavior. On further increase in temperature, we see a non-Newtonian response. And then further increase in response temperature, we see a Newtonian response. So bitumen is temperature sensitive. It is not a same response throughout the temperature. If you have at least four different response, you can see here from a glassy behavior, viscoelastic behavior, non-Newtonian behavior, and a Newtonian behavior. So Newtonian response is during mixing and compaction, non-Newtonian response again during compaction stage. This viscoelastic response is something what we see at the, uh, the temperature range of 10 to 70 degrees Celsius. This is what our payment service temperature is, 10 degrees Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius. So it is not purely elastic, not purely viscous. It is a combination of the viscous behavior and elastic behavior. So vitamin exhibits a viscoelastic behavior during payment service conditions. So it's a viscoelastic fluid behavior is viscous, elastic solid behavior is elastic. So depending upon whether the fluid behavior dominates or a solid behavior dominates, we call it as a viscoelastic solid or a viscoelastic fluid. See, at high temperature, vitamin will be relatively fluid compared to low temperature. So, we, at 70 degree, for instance, vitamin will be viscoelastic fluid. And at 10 degree Celsius, vitamin will be viscoelastic solid. So, there is a transition even within this viscoelastic region, depending on whether the viscous behavior dominates or elastic behavior dominates. So, if it is a viscoelastic fluid, what will happen? Or if it is a viscoelastic solid, what will happen? So, if it's a viscoelastic fluid, you, you can see a permanent deformation. So, we do uh, payment drugs very quickly if it is a viscoelastic fluid. Or extent of permanent deformation will be more when the vitamin exhibits viscoelastic fluid. As the transition, as the temperature reduces, when it becomes viscoelastic solid, the deformation Information value will be lesser. So it is very important to understand when the payment will, when the uh, vitamin will exhibit viscoelastic solid kind of a behavior or when, the, when it will exhibit viscoelastic fluid kind of a behavior. So how do we uh, study viscoelastic solid fluid behavior? So we need uh, some factor to say that okay, this is uh, okay. I studied the modulus value, so uh, this says that this is viscoelastic solid kind of a behavior. Okay, so we need some factor, some functions to quantify viscoelastic solid or a fluid kind of a behavior. Generally, viscoelastic uh, characteristics of a material uh, can be understood using three different tests one is sleep and recovery test, other is stress relaxation test, and third one is oscillatory shear testing. So, three pen recovery test, stress relaxation test, oscillatory shear test, this characterizes the viscoelastic material. See, this itself is a separate course, characterization of the viscoelastic material. We can take it as a separate course. But just I have included a few slides just for you to understand what is three pen recovery test, stress relaxation test, and oscillatory shear test. Not too many, just to give a, a, a tell you what is this kind of a behavior. So now if you see this uh, creep and recovery curve, you have already seen this creep recovery curve. You can see that the creep compliance here depends on, I mean the creep value here depends on the time or we measure the modulus called as a creep compliance which is a strain as a function of stress, strain, ratio of strain to stress. So the strain is a function of time, it's a time dependent behavior. You have already seen this creep recovery test. So the typical creep recovery response of a vitamin after two different temperatures is what is seen here. This is something a repeated loading. What we do is we load the vitamin, give some rest period for a recovery. Again load a vitamin, again give some rest period for a recovery. So just do it repeatedly. So what will happen is, uh, let us see the specific one cycle. So during loading the material creeps. There is increase in strain you can see. And during rest period, you can see that the recovery, the strain is recovering slowly, but it is not completely recovering. You can see there is a residual strain. Now you just compare between a 25 degrees Celsius and a 55 degrees Celsius. The first two figures A and B are 25 degrees Celsius. The second and third one, third and fourth one is at 55 degrees Celsius. When you compare it, 
at 25 degrees Celsius, you can see a part recovery, but at 55 degrees Celsius, almost no recovery. So this is a temperature sensitive characteristic. So like at 55 degrees, the deformation, permanent deformation is more compared to 25 degrees Celsius. So in the stress relaxation test, what we do is uh, like we hold the strain, we stretch the material, hold it for some time, constant. So what will happen to the modulus or what will happen to the stress? Your top, you can even imagine as a stress here. So what will happen in for this viscoelastic material, the stress starts decreasing for a constant strain. So if you look into the different temperature behavior from 15 to 40, you have for a different temperature behavior, you can see that the, the stress value or the torque value reduces as the temperature is high. So at very high temperature, you may not be able to measure a torque. You can immediately see a reduction in the torque to zero. So this just happened in 10, 11 minutes from 1000 to uh, in a decimals. This just happened in 10 seconds. So when you further increase the temperature, it will suddenly, there will, uh, means that you cannot hold it, the stress will go to zero immediately. So we measure a modulus called the relaxation modulus, EFT is here a relaxation modulus. It is a function of stress by strain. You, uh, you see the stress is a time function. Stress is not constant, it is a time function and it reduces with time. Um, the next is a oscillatory shearing, which is a very common test. Uh, we use it for a viscoelastic material. So what we do is, I'll just quickly go through this. Then what we do is, we keep the vitamin between uh, two plates and we shear it, we oscillate it. You can see a, a schematic here. We, we, we oscillate this, when you oscillate it, so uh, you apply a deformation to a material in this pattern, in a sinusoidal way. So you can control the maximum value, you can control the time. So this is just one second. So what you, when you apply this kind of an oscillation, if the material is purely elastic, you can see that stress and strain happens at the same, peak value happens at the same instant of time. When it is viscous, you can see that there is a lag between a stress and strain. This lag is what we call it as a phase lag. And this phase lag value will be 90 for a viscous material. For a viscoelastic material, if you see, the value will be from 0 to 90 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees. So uh, the bitumen exhibits a viscoelastic material, there will be always a lag between a stress and the strain. So it is a combination of viscous, viscous portion and the elastic behavior. It's a combination of both elastic and the viscous behavior that gives you the viscoelastic behavior. So uh, uh, now if you see, uh, do for this oscillatory shear testing, oscillatory shear testing, we measure complex modulus, we measure complex modulus, uh, it's a complex number which measures G prime and G double prime. So you have a G prime here which represents the elastic portion. G double prime is a loss modulus which represents a viscous portion. This is a complex modulus which is used to measure, which is used to characterize the oscillatory shear testing. And the mod of this complex number is what we call it as a dynamic modulus. And you can determine the phase angle which you see a lag between a stress and strain using this storage modulus, elastic uh, loss modulus and the storage modulus. Loss modulus is, represents a viscous portion and the storage modulus represents the elastic portions. Now, if you look into the modulus value here, let us just uh, focus on the second figure. Uh, for time being, we'll skip the first one. Focus on the second figure. Now, if you see this, uh, you can see the uh, modulus variation. This is storage modulus and the loss modulus. G prime is storage modulus, elastic modulus. G double prime is a viscous modulus. So now if you see the variation in the modulus with respect to temperature, so you can see the variations like at very high temperature, at a higher temperature, uh, let us take the case of uh, 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, so, sorry, this is a different frequency. Let us take the case of 35 Hertz frequency. So now if you see 35 Hertz frequency, uh, the filled one is storage modulus, elastic modulus. So at very high temperature, uh, it's a viscous modulus that dominates the storage modulus. And as the temperature reduces, elastic modulus, elastic portion dominates the viscous portions. So now uh, there is a point where there is a, um, elastic modulus and the viscous modulus are equal. And this is a crossover temperature. Now you can see it, this for this material, VG30, it happens at 27 degrees Celsius. 
so at hour 27 it is a uh, fluid behavior dominates or a uh, viscous behavior dominates and below 27 degree it is a solid behavior dominates so this characteristic behavior and it depends on what is the frequency of testing the frequency can be related to the speed of the vehicle so high frequency represents a high speed vehicle and low frequency represents a low speed vehicle so now you can this is uh, one such literature published uh, by us you can see a viscoelastic solid fluid transition for a different uh, a different binder at different aging conditions so you can see that at low temperature vitamin exhibits a viscoelastic solid there is a temperature region in which there can be a viscoelastic solid or a viscoelastic fluid it depends upon the frequency of testing and then there is a temperature above which the vitamin exhibits a viscoelastic fluid now why do you want to know whether this this viscoelastic fluid or a viscoelastic solid so i say that viscoelastic fluid is more Uh, 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 if you, if the vitamin behaves as a viscoelastic fluid, the payment runs more, and viscoelastic solid, extreme temperature, the payment cracks more. So to understand the distress in the vitamin, I uh, it will be good if I know whether it exhibits a viscoelastic fluid behavior or whether it exhibits a viscoelastic solid behavior. So now uh, most of the studies we use here. it uses a linear measures like we say modulus creep compliance is a modulus measure relaxation is also a modulus measure like storage modulus elastic modulus or a loss modulus which is nothing but a viscous modulus or a phase angle is also a linear measures so linear measure is applicable when the load is very very small when when the deformation in the material is infinite in uh, it's very small And the deformation in the material is very small. If this measures are all applicable, now what will happen if the traffic load is too high or if the deformation in the material is too high? These measures becomes meaningless. Free compliance, relaxation modulus, storage and loss modulus. All these measures uh, may not be uh, may not be applicable when the response of the material is non-linear. So we have a DSP funded uh, project in which we are trying to quantify the Temperature susceptibility of a vitamin using some non-linear measures. So one such non-linear measure we used here is an energy dissipation. So you know that viscoelastic material dissipates energy. So elastic material will never dissipate energy when you load it. Material deforms. When you remove the load, it readily uh, recovers back. There is no dissipation in the material. Viscous material deforms completely. and the viscoelastic material between a elastic and a viscous there will be an energy dissipation in the material so you can see a measure of energy dissipation in the material across different temperature at different strain levels in this 10% strain will be a kind of a very high strain which is a non linear behavior so you can see that the energy dissipation in the material is a temperature dependent and we are trying to capture a Tem temperature sensitivity of the binder uh, in, uh, using this energy dissipations. So you can see this energy dissipation plotted as the inverse of temperature. So here at the beginning it is a low temperature and uh, it's a inverse of temperature. So this is high temperature and this is low temperature. So now if you see that why it is plotted as the inverse of temperature is you might have known uh, uh, Archimedes equation. So just to fit and uh, check whether this uh, energy dissipation satisfies the Archimedes equation. And uh, we just plotted it with respect to the uh, inverse of temperature, and you can see that this uh, dotted line is a Arrhenius fit. Arrhenius fit energy dissipation is very linearly with the inverse of temperature. This is an uh, Arrhenius fit. So the Arrhenius fit, the energy dissipation is compared with the Arrhenius fit. You can see that uh, the material uh, energy dissipation trend deviates uh, within this temperature. Of 20 to 70 degrees Celsius. At high temperature, it satisfies the Arrhenius equation. At low temperature, it uh, it is not satisfying the Arrhenius equation. What does it mean? Is there is a behavior transition, uh, transition in the behavior of vitamin within this temperature range of 20 to 70 degrees Celsius. Now we are trying to use this energy dissipation plot to capture the cumulative uh, distress at all temperature. So this is a schematic figure. you can see that in the schematic you can see energy dissipation as a function of temperature so let us see the schematic very carefully so this is an energy dissipation as a function of temperature 
So energy dissipation, this is what uh, the trend was. We have shown an experimental result. The trend was varying something like this. You have two different slopes. So at low temperature, you have one slope. And at high temperature, we have another slope. Now what do I define? I define a minimum temperature based on the energy, the energy, uh, energy dissipation value. So I define a low temperature for a rutting. So uh, the temperature corresponding to the initiation of the rutting is defined based on the energy dissipation. Let me take this as a temperature corresponding to the initiation of the rutting. So above this temperature, I measure the cumulative deformation from the energy dissipation and use it to characterize the rutting. So now again for a fatigue cracking, I define a maximum temperature above which the payment will never crack. So from this maximum temperature range, I measure the cumulative energy dissipation to measure the fatigue cracking. So it's a cumulative and does not, does not depend on only one temperature, it's a cumulative dissipation, cumulative energy dissipation from an extreme temperature. So I need to define an extreme temperature for a thing and an extreme temperature for a fatigue cracking to uh, ramp the binder for a rutting under fatigue cracking. Uh, so this work is in progress. Uh, now we are, current, we are currently working on this. So I'm, finally we would like to ramp the binder based on, for a rutting and a fatigue cracking based on this. So we are using a modified binders and unmodified binders of different grade VG10, VG30 binders. And uh, this ranking is currently in progress. So uh, I'm done with my presentation. Thank you so much for your patient listening. And uh, I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, ma'am. Shall I stop sharing? Uh, yes, ma'am. Participant, you can now ask ask your question. You can just post your question in the chat box. Ma'am, before that, uh, actually, they have asked a question from a slide 21. Oh, okay. if you okay. want, okay. you can so, so the for the track of the slide. I want. Yeah. Shall okay. I read the question, ma'am, because it's in slide. Yeah. Madam, yeah, yeah. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Madam, can you come to the window? Can, can you show your... Uh, uh, what you call it? You, you, you set the screen, please. Sir, uh, I uh, just one second, sir. I will just see what is slide 21. And then, um, but yeah, thank you, thank you, I... thank you, thank you. Yeah, slide 21, yes. What is the question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, information shared in slide 21, does it mean uh, that okay, uh, 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 okay. is better than admixture? Yeah, I can read it. I will read it. Okay. Does it mean that VG30 is better than admixture okay. such as Levotherm and Sosovit at higher temperature regime? Uh, um, see, this again. Uh, okay. We, you are asking this because uh, permanent deformation of a VG30, you are comparing a permanent deformation of VG30, Levotherm and a Sosovit, and you are asking this question. Um, see, it all depends on, uh, uh, like, uh, what is the strain level we use to measure? Uh, we have a one paper like uh, how the Evertherm and Sasovit behaviors uh, varies with respect to the strain level. It all depends on the uh, amount of uh, admixtures we add. Uh, and again, so many factors uh, controls here. Uh, we cannot just uh, say it based on one parameter here. There are so many parameters. And again, uh, if this is just uh, one temperature characteristics. It is not, not, as we said, we have to study the uh, temperature sensitive characteristics we need to study across different temperature not one specific extreme temperature we need to look into a different temperature region hope i cleared your doubt okay anybody anybody if you have questions please post in the chat box please sir i can read one more question uh, is there any type of study results available on rutting within the surface is applied when thermoplastic paint marking. Uh, I'm not sure, sir. Thermoplastic paint marking. Uh, this is not my area of expertise. I need to look into it. Um, Arvind Kumar, sir, has asked, how could temperature susceptibility of 60 by 70 vitamin be lower than that of 40 by 50 vitamin? Uh, 
60 by 70 bitumen again at what temperature we measure uh, uh, this is at uh, one temperature measure penetration we generally measure it at 25 degrees celsius um, again uh, 40 by 50 is also a penetration that we measure at 25 degrees celsius we would like to know a temperature susceptible if you want to study the temperature susceptible characteristics you need to measure the property of different temperature and uh, study the variation in the slope of the material and only then uh, we can just compare and say that uh, which material is more temperature susceptible. What causes uh, crack on the pavement? Uh, pavement, is, pavement generally cracks at the, end, uh, at the end of the age. That is as the pavement ages, one factor is aging, other factor is uh, uh, when the load is too high and when you apply a repeated loading, uh, so repeated loading, aging conditions and temperature uh, characteristics are the three main factors that causes crack on the pavement. And this, uh, assuming that uh, you have used the uh, mixture that satisfies the fatigue cracking needs, the three main parameters are temperature of the pavement, load on the pavement and the third one is uh, aging characteristics of the bitumen. Uh, these are the main uh, main factors that affects the crack on the pavement. So the next question is in the last slide at low temperature rutting is initiated and at high temperature petty cracking is initiated in your energy dissipation model. Is it not the contradictory with the temperature? Now I say that uh, maximum temperature I limit, it is not initiated, I limit the temperature. See I limit the high temperature and say that after high temperature, when after the payment means the maximum temperature, I limit it for the fatigue and rutting. So when uh, payment temperature is maximum value, uh, so, sorry not a maximum value, when the payment is, uh, when the temperature of the payment goes beyond a particular limit, uh, or I fix the temperature for maximum uh, fatigue. Means when the payment temperature increases beyond that particular temperature, the payment will not crack. So at lower temperature, the payment cracks. Likewise, I define a minimum temperature so that at, as the temperature goes below the minimum value, the payment will never rut. So I define this extreme limit for measuring the fatigue and rutting, uh, rutting characteristics. Okay, it is not the initiation, it is the end. So, hope I answered uh, uh, Dr. Lambika's question. Next is, as you have said that based on different climate conditions, the viscosity of a binder, we need to select what if we have and conditions like very low and very high temperature at the same location. Now, we need to look into the different, uh, different binder. It satisfies both the temperature or maybe a modified binder will help. Uh, to, uh, you can modify the property of a binder using a modified binders, using a modifier so that you can improve a specific property, whether a low temperature property or a high temperature property. So uh, you can select a modifier based on your requirement. The next question is, is the temperature susceptibility can be found out from the rheological property of the binder? Yes, that is what we are doing. You measure a rheology. rheological property of a binder is it's any kind of a flow behavior. It can be a dynamic modulus, it can be a phase angle, it can be a, a relaxation modulus, it can be a pre compliance, it can be any function. That is what we are trying to do. We measure all these rheological, any, any function, any characteristic behavior at different temperature and you can characterize the temperature sensitive behavior of the binder. Uh, nice presentation, ma'am. Can you please give a short explanation on master curve? Yeah. Master curve is something which we uh, plotted for. Uh, uh, it's, uh, say for instance, uh, we do a laboratory testing. Uh, for, uh, assume like it is an oscillatory shear, a frequency sweep test, or uh, take an example of a creep and recovery test. See, we do a laboratory testing, we observe a creep value for a limited period of time, maybe for five, seconds, five minutes, for example, we know what is, what is the creep for five minutes. And we measure it at different temperature. 
Now we wanted to know uh, at extreme time and extreme temperature, uh, how do we uh, uh, how do we predict the behavior, creep behavior at extreme temperature that we have not measured, or extreme time that we have not measured in the laboratory. So what we can do is we can use a time temperature superposition principle using a time temperature superposition. So we are going to superpose time and temperature. So time temperature we match the value, we superpose the time temperature behavior and club all the temperature behavior into a one temperature, we call it as a standard temperature and we get the extended time, extended time. So we get the creep response of the extended time. Uh, so we grab all the temperature together and we get one simple curve for the extended time that is what we call it as a master curve. Uh, again this master curve is applicable only in the region where there is no transition, where the material exhibits a single response, either a Newtonian response or single non-Newtonian response or a viscoelastic response. And uh, for more detail on the master curve you can contact us, so it is again a uh, uh, two three hours course. Uh, so how many years we can store vitamin without using? It is okay to use after several years. Is there any limitations? See, we have something called as a steric hardening. When you store a vitamin, uh, uh, there will be a hardening of a vitamin. Those hardening is a reversible process. Steric hardening. When you heat it, that steric hardening is a reversible process. Uh, and there's something like the, how do you store a vitamin, whether in an airtight container uh, or it's, whether it is getting oxidized. If the vitamin getting oxidized, again the property of a vitamin will change. Vitamin, if it ages, the property of a vitamin will change. So again, chemical stability, I think Professor Nimita will deal more about the chemical stability of a vitamin. So, is there any other question? Any other questions? Anybody else? Any questions, please? Another three minutes more. Thank you very much to uh, uh, Dr. Bhakmaraka, Madam, for sharing your valuable time. Shobana, you can take the mic. Tell us thank you. Yes, sir. And thank you, sir. To inf inform the participants to uh, fill up the feedback forms. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your valuable time. Uh, thank you. Now, thank you, ma'am. Now I request all the participants to fill your feedback and make sure uh, you will be present in the next section. You have now a lunch break, which starts now until 2 p.m. And we will meet at the next session of the day. That is a session three at 2 p.m. sharp. The next session starts at 2 p.m. So kindly be on time at 2 p.m. after the lunch break. So kindly fill the feedback links and submit the link. Thank you all the participants for your patience. Thank you, Shobhana. Thank, thank you, Bhadurega, madam. So, uh, leave, yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear, dear participants, please, please uh, fill the feedback form and they can go for your lunch and come back again around 140, 150. You can enter again. Two o'clock uh, shortly. The program will be started. Thank you very much. This is Dr. Rajan, coordinator of this STTP program, MNM Engineering College, Department of Safety Engineering.